go and do that, I'm like, well, I'm going to preach a message that will work more for new people. And then, uh, then we get a mass, mass uh, flu epidemic or something hits the church and all kinds of people are out sick and whatnot. And then it's uh, negative temperatures and they don't show up. But I'll be honest with you, uh, I think this, the Lord's still in this. Uh, because this message here was a, a big help to me. And, uh, and I think it'll be a blessing to you because uh, we've had some tough preaching lately. I got a message from somebody, he's not even here. Uh, I got a message from somebody this week saying, hey, that preaching's been real tough lately, but it's been good. I appreciate it. That sword really cuts, but it's been a blessing. So, I mean, that's the right attitude, and I appreciate that. But uh, I know it's been tough lately, and this morning I think I'll get a little bit of a break on the toughness of it, and we're just going to bask a little bit in the goodness of God. Amen. I want to preach to you on a king and a dead dog. A king and a dead dog. If you would stand with me, 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll start reading in verse number 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Meshur, the son of Amael, in Lodabar. And then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Meshur, the son of Amael, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself. And said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till, till, shall till the land for him. And thou shalt bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table." Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for, as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. For he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Kelly, would you ask the Lord to bless the preaching, please? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now this morning I want to look with you at the kindness of King David. I see a lot we can learn here. In verse number 3 he said he wanted to show the kindness of God unto him. We can learn a lot about the kindness of God towards us by watching the behavior of King David towards this dead dog as he called himself and titled himself a man lame on both of his feet. King David showed a, a true understanding of God, a true type of God the Father. And what we're going to do is preach down through here and dissect this thing and take a look at how God has truly been kind to you and I. In order to set the stage, though, I need you to keep your finger here in 2 Samuel. And let's flip over to the book of Acts, if you would, please. Acts chapter number 13. We need to understand what it is about David that made him such a type of Jesus Christ or such a type of God the Father. Acts chapter 13 explains it. 
I, I've pondered a lot on this subject. I, I've seen a lot how the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. I've studied through the types in the Bible and looked at how David is so much like the Lord Jesus Christ. And David is so much like God the Father. And you look at all the Bible that David wrote and I think, what in the world is it? Because I've been infatuated with David for years. So what in the world is it about this man that made him such a great man before God? I mean, he, God didn't even allow him to build a church, quote unquote. God wouldn't even allow him to build the temple. He allowed his son to do it, but he wouldn't allow David to do it because his hands were bloody. David's a man that committed adultery and then killed the, man's, uh, the, the woman's husband in order to cover up his sin. David is not a perfect man. And yet, at the same time, a man capable of killing, a man capable of committing adultery, a man capable of doing some of the worst things, God picked somebody, and when God picked him, it said, it was David that God picked, a man after my own heart. David even said, he liked me to put me on the throne. Why did God like David? He wasn't perfect. Acts chapter 13, I finally get it. When you look at verse number 22, it says this, and when he had removed him, talking about removing Saul from the throne, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Two things I noticed. I noticed, number one, when God was looking for somebody to pastor the flock, when God was looking for somebody to take care of the sheep, when God was looking for a king that would treat the people right, God saw something in David, and God picked him. What was it, though, that caused David to be the man who had been making the decisions, who had been doing the things, who had been developing the character to be the king of Israel, to be somebody that God would say, David, I'm going to entrust you with the leadership of my people. What was it that had been going on in David's life that eventually got him to that point? Because David did not expect to be anointed king. David's dad didn't see it coming. Nobody voted David in as the most likely to succeed at the high school you know, yearbook. That wasn't David at all. Actually, uh, D David's dad brought all the boys in and set all the boys before the prophet to say, is this him, is this him, is this him, is this him? Nope, none of them. And they forgot about David. He said, don't you have any more sons? Oh, yeah, go get the kid. It ain't going to be him. He must have the wrong family. But it was David God anointed. You know what had been happening quietly in David's life? He'd been learning to fulfill all the will of God. He had been content with God's will, with where God placed him, sitting over there, forgot about by everybody, strumming the harp, watching the sheep, making sure they had good pasture, making sure that they were animals. You can tell a lot about somebody's character by how they do treat their animals, by the way. The righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender, tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. They were animals, that's all they were. And, and there he was making sure they had good drinking water and good food and that he was keeping them safe and he was staying awake at night so that the lion and the bear couldn't come in and destroy those sheep. And God was watching that boy worship God, walk with God, fulfill the will of God and, and, and faithfully with the right heart, with the right spirit, with the right attitude over the long haul, do right by the little bit that he had and take what little bit he had as very, very, very seriously as he possibly could and then God said all right I want you to go and anoint that boy he's the king because he's one that will take care of my people the right way because he's been fulfilling all my will so when David's a type of God or David's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ it's because of the way he treated others my preacher always used to say this watch out for any man who kowtows to his superiors and then is hard on his inferiors. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shut up! What are you doing? Come on! What's taking you so long? How come you're late? What are you doing? Come on! Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. I hope I'm not in trouble. I'm sorry I'm late. You're a dirty, rotten dog. You ain't a David. Amen. But I'm not trying to be harsh this morning, so I'm going to get off that because I could start preaching right there. I've seen too much of that bully stuff. Can't stand it. 
Now in this Old Testament passage back in 2 Samuel 9, I think we see a real life illustration of what made David that man who was after God's own heart. And I hope not only that you and I will develop these things in ourselves, but I hope more importantly this morning that we'll recognize that our David has been good to a dead dog like you and I. Our king has showed us kindness. How is this kindness of the king revealed? First of all, it was given to one who was a sinner. I mean, you and I are sinners, are we not? Mephibosheth in this text is very much a type of you and I. While David is a type of God, David is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, Mephibosheth is Mike Reagan, and Mephibosheth is fill in your name. That's us. And the kindness of the king was shown to one who was a sinner, and proof he's a sinner is he was born into the wrong family. Look at verse 1. David said, Is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness? For Jonathan's sake. He didn't say, is there any of Jonathan's children? He said purposely, this is why you don't change one word of the word of God. You don't, if you're, I don't care how much of a scholar you think you are, we'll get on that tonight. I don't care how smart these guys think they are. When they go in and say this shouldn't say that because this doesn't make sense, they are wrong and God's always right. I don't buy this garbage that God's powerful enough to create the heavens and the earth, speak those stars into existence, He just flung them out there, man, like it was nothing. Give life to you and I, and he can't preserve a book. Would you stink and give me a break? And if I thought that God was that weak and that anemic, I would resign this church right now. How would you survive? I don't know. I'd sell drugs or something. (laughs) Something more noble than getting up here and saying, I believe a book I don't believe. Amen. I'm not just trying to be crude. I'm telling you something more noble than getting up here and saying I'm a preacher and saying I'm here to represent God and preach the word of God while not believing the book he gave me. I believe that book with all my heart. And I believe it ought to say, is there any that is left of the house of Saul? I believe it ought to say that because God said it. And God's trying to show us something. God was kind to somebody who was a sinner born into the wrong house. Saul was the enemy of David, was he not? You know what happened to you and I? We were born into the wrong house. What do you mean? Well, your mom and dad? You saying something about my mom? Oh, everybody's mom and dad. I'm now a mom and dad. My kids are born in the wrong house. You know what they were born under? Sin. It comes natural. (laughs) Sin's not anything you have to work at. It just kind of flows, man. It's easy. Right out of the gate. The Bible says they go forth from the womb speaking lies. Sometimes that baby knows how to cry and whine and complain and throw a fit. And you're like, what's going on? Oh, she must have a bellyache. Something must be rubbing her belly and you're bouncing her and you're patting her back. And the second you pick her up, she stops. All of a sudden, all the pain went away. You lay her down. Ah! They're dying again. You know what they're doing? They're lying to you. They're screaming like something's wrong because they want something. Now, I know nutty people who you know, like, oh, I swat them when they're lying. I'm, you're a moron, man. I'll show you in a second. That's stupid stuff. Don't go off balance with the thing. But understand the reality that we're born sinners. That baby, that beautiful little baby, man, praise God for the baby, man. You watch Katie and John just glowing, man. It's like you walk in there and it looks like they're going to blow up, man. The head's like, you know, they're just so proud of themselves and so happy. And, and isn't it a blessing? Not picking on them. I did it four times, and every time I was about to lose it, man. I don't care how, I don't care, you, you, you have to be one wicked and calloused and hard person not to feel like your chest is going to pop when you got that baby. You walk in the room and you're like, everybody's looking at my baby. <laughs> right? It's a blessing to see, man. What a, what a, fruit of the womb is his reward. It's a blessing. But you know what that little baby is born to do? Is born to eventually die. You know why? Because we're all sinners. All of sin to come short of the glory of God, that's me. I'm getting older, one day at a time, and so are you. You talk, oh, I feel great, I feel young, I feel young. Whatever, you're still in your 50s, you're still in your 60s, you're still in your 70s. No matter how you, well, I might be getting older in body, but I'm young in spirit. Okay, but you're still getting older, all right? You are going to die. Why? Because you're a sinner. You're born into the wrong house, and you had nothing to do with it. You had no option, you had no choice. Well, I'm glad God showed some kindness to somebody who was born in the wrong house. 
Born into the house of his enemy. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved from wrath through his life. It's an amazing thing to me that Almighty God would love me when I did not love him. It's one thing to love somebody. I mean, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Our love for God has nothing to do with, it can't compare to, it can't add up to. It's not motivated by the love he had for us. It's more than you and I can comprehend. We love him in return. That's not like loving your enemy. That's not like for no good reason saying, hey, is there anybody out there who's of the house of my enemy that I can show kindness to? I'm sorry, but that's just not in my nature. It's in my nature to say, If you want to hurt me, I'll hurt you first. Well, that ain't right. Well, that's not very spiritual. I mean, well, you can pretend to be something you're not all you want. I'm being honest. I didn't say I'm going to hurt you first. I asked God to help me be more like Jesus Christ. Amen? I try to control myself. But it's in my nature to say, you hurt me, I'll hurt you back. Hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, shame on me, right? You know the whole motive of that thing is? It's self-preservation. It's a lack of kindness. It's a lack of true love. God ain't like that. Here's King David, a a man, truly a sinful man. God showed us how sinful he is, and yet he's developed a heart that is so much like God that he goes to find somebody who is his enemy and do good to their child. That, to me, just absolutely blows my mind. How could God love me as much as I've sinned against him? Go down your laundry list. Don't confess it to anybody else. That's, that's religious fool, tomfoolery. That ain't in the Bible. It says confess your faults. There's one verse. It says faults, not sins. Don't change the Bible. Because when you change the Bible, you can create your own doctrinal religions and do the own things that you want to do and manipulate and mind control people. Faults are different than sins. Don't confess your sins to me or anybody else, but why don't you go through your little laundry list right now? Things you wouldn't want anybody to know. God loved you anyhow? I'm not talking about the things you did before you were saved when you didn't know any better. I'm talking about the things you've done since you were saved. I heard one preacher say, I was saved at seven years old. I have committed more sin against God since my salvation than I ever did before. I was saved at five. I've committed more sin against God since my salvation than I ever did from zero to five. I I know, I'm sorry. My testimony is not such that Before I was saved, I was a heroin addict. I really wasn't shooting heroin at four years old. I know you probably don't believe that, but it's the truth. So, well, what happened to you, preacher? Something was wrong when mama dropped me, amen? My father-in-law told the kids last night that when I was... (laughs) He said, when your daddy was born, your daddy was so ugly, the doctor slapped your mom. (laughs) That's terrible. (laughs) And my mother-in-law, God bless her, man. Did you you hear that or was I laughing too hard? (laughs) I thought it was great. When you were born, your daddy was so ugly that the doctor slapped your mom. Amen. But uh, I, I, my mother-in-law pops up, pops up in the background. She says, girls, he's so hard on your daddy because he's just jealous. I said, you officially won the greatest mother-in-law on the planet award. God bless you. He'll never be able to win that. Now, he started in again trying to get the thing balanced back out right. You know, and I walked up and I looked in the little FaceTime thing and I said, dad, mom's last statement. I rest my case. Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, man. I don't know if it's good or not, but it's funny. I don't even know what the point was. I lost track. God's been kind to me. I was born into the wrong thing. I've sinned against God more since. I honestly don't know why God continues to be kind to me. Sin more since my salvation than I ever did before. But he's still kind. It really blows my mind. I'm not just saying that. As his kindness was given to a sinner, it's proven not only by the fact that he was wrong into, uh, born into the wrong family, but let's look at the type even more. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 4, just, just five chapters back. Shortly after his birth, there was a fall. Now, I'll comfort your heart a little bit in this, and just I'll throw it out there. We could do a deep study on it, but we're not going to. I'll just throw it out there for you. 
When a little baby is born, even though they were born to sinful parents and sin was passed down to those kids from the parents, that baby is safe until it's reached what we call the age of accountability. At some point in every individual's life, they literally die. Like, not just they're buried. Spiritually, there's a true, literal, spiritual death that takes place. Okay? And it's, it's the age of accountability. At some point, every individual recognizes that they sin, and they choose to sin anyhow. Could be four. Usually it's not. Very, very rare. Some people say, I was saved at four, and they are absolutely the rarest of the rare. Five is probably a decent age, and I'll show you why. Six, and in some nations, depending on how much gospel light there is and whatnot, I've heard some preachers say up to eight, and ten, and eleven. I, don't, I think that's kind of getting a little old in my own opinion. I think you're probably averaging between five and six, seven. Now, if somebody is severely retarded and they stay on a two- or a three-year-old level or less their whole life, they're safe. Never capable of understanding right and wrong and choosing wrong, not capable of understanding the gospel, they go to heaven. David had a baby die, and David said this, I shall go to him, but he cannot come to me. All right? So God shows you in the Bible those babies go to heaven. All right? Watch 2 Samuel 4, 4. And Jonathan Saul's son had a son that was lame on his feet. He was five years old. You see it? Five is the number of death in the Bible. That's why I think it's right around that five-year-old mark, in my opinion. When the tidings came of Saul, and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. You know what happened to the boy? He fell. You know what happened to you? You've fallen. And because of your sinful fall, your feet are messed up. You can't walk right. You got nothing to offer the king. Nothing. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What do you and I have to offer? We're messed up. We've fallen. Yeah, you would joke about being dropped, but this boy really literally was dropped. At five years old, she's in a rush to get out. Hey, the enemy's coming. She's trying to keep the baby safe. And uh, through her best efforts, she can't do anything to keep him from falling. She drops him. In other words, mom and dad, you can't save your kid. Like we were talking about in the announcements, you know, uh, a lot of churches do the baby baptism to wash away original sin and all this stuff that they make up that has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible anywhere. It gives parents a false hope. You don't need that. You got the Bible. God knows that that baby is too young to understand that baby is safe. And you baptizing that baby does not save that soul. But if you want to dedicate your child to Jesus Christ, you're saying, I'll do my best to raise him for God. Because our best efforts result in the baby that falls and that can't get up. How are sinful parents going to create perfect human beings? How are those that need to be saved ever going to offer salvation to somebody else? There was one. There was one who rose from the grave in his own power. There was one who defeated sin himself. There was one who defeated death himself. There was one who defeated the grave himself. There was one who defeated the devil himself. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the rest of us are lame on our feet. Just like Mephibosheth. Because of a fall. He was in a bad spot back in 2 Samuel 9. Verse number 4 tells us he's in Lodabar. Well, Lodabar means without pasture. The kindness of God was given to somebody who was born into the wrong family, who was lame on his feet, was given to somebody who had no pasture, who was in the wrong place. You know why God allows churches like ours to get started and to grow and to be established in the community? Because there are some people out there, not who deserve it, not who are worthy of it, not who have been the right pedigree, and where did you go to Bible college, and who was your dad, and how were you raised, and blah, 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 none of that stuff. None of that stuff is the kindness of God. Hey, God allows a church to be established in a community because he sees a bunch of lame people who can't walk on their own, who need something to eat, and they're in a place where they got no food spiritually, and they need some Bible, and they need some help. God's kindness goes and says, get them from Lodabar and bring them somewhere where they can eat. That's where he was at. The kindness of God shows up when I'm starving. 
The kindness of God shows up when I have nothing. Lodabar also means no word. Reminds me of Amos. God says he's going to send a famine. In judgment, he's going to send a famine on the land. He says not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, I think it is, but it says of hearing of the words of the Lord. We're in that famine today in America. The problem is most people don't want to hear. And that's the worst famine you can get. Remember I taught you a few weeks ago about starvation and how eventually at the most severe points of starvation, uh, an individual stops being hungry and actually enters into a state of what's called ketosis, where their body is feeding on the muscle and feeding on the brain and feeding on the internal organs, and they actually go into what's, what, what, what they feel is a state of euphoria. Just like Americans. Just drunken drug addicted, fornicating, even if you don't drink and you don't do dope, fornicating, even if you don't drink, don't do dope, don't fornicate, just got the money, got the cars, got the popularity, got the good times, got the entertainment, we got it all, and we are literally starving, we're literally dying on our feet spiritually, we don't realize how bad off we are, and God's kindness comes along and says, listen, I'm going to get you out of that place, and I'm going to put you somewhere where you can get some nourishment, you can get some help, and you can get some strength. And it's the kindness of God on a lame sinner to feed us even when we're in a bad place and we're happy there. Second thing we see is that the kindness of the king was granted on behalf of another. Nowhere in this passage does it ever show you that God showed kindness to Mephibosheth because of Mephibosheth. You know what we like to do? Well, God's blessing me because... Well, God's been really good to me, brother, but I think it's because I... Uh, Let me finish that sentence for you. Because you're absolutely clueless and you don't know or understand God. Because you're self-conceited and self-promoting and self-righteous. You know what God does? I know know that hurts. And I told you, I'm trying to be nicer this morning. This is you being nice? Yeah, I'm in a great mood. I got great sleep this weekend. Amen. You You know what it is, folks? We're in a society that has us brainwashed into thinking the wrong things about ourselves. We look at our worldview as all skewed, and it's nothing like what this book shows us. And really, literally, you say, you sound so mean and so harsh. Literally, if you could understand this, if this could sink down past your brain into your heart, and you could get a proper view of yourself and of this world from this book... You you wouldn't feel at all like, man, that's so mean, that's so harsh. You would say, man, that's so amazing. Yes, sir. Amen. And it puts your whole world together. Everything starts making sense. There's a lot of questions out there, isn't there? Aren't there a lot of questions? Just be honest. I, I can throw some out at you. Why do babies get sick and die? Why is it that wicked people get away with stuff and good people always seem to suffer? You know, all the answers are here. And man, when you start getting a hold of God's word, it all starts making sense. And you're just, boy, it it establishes you. It strengthens you. It settles you. And you don't need the stuff of this world to have the joy of the Lord. Can I tell you, God showed kindness to me not because of me. Because I was his enemy. When I was yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I didn't do him any favors. I didn't care about him. All I cared about was myself, my selfishness, my sin. He showed him kindness for Jonathan's sake. You know why God has showed you and I kindness? For the sake of Jesus Christ. It's not because of us. It's not because of what we do, what we have done, or what we ever will do. What are you doing for the Lord? That stuff just kind of like, nauseates me after a while. You know, it's typically coming from, you know, young preachers or Bible college types, you know. What are you doing for the Lord, brother? What are you doing for God? You know what I'm doing for God? Let me brag a minute or two how spiritual I am. What are you doing for the Lord? Um, going home. <laughs> yeah, really. I want to sit on the couch and have a conversation with my wife. I'm going to tell my kids, hurry up, we got to go. What are you doing for, what are, that's what, I'm, what are you doing for God? I, like, God needs us so bad. He's sitting there, oh my goodness, what am I going to do if they don't do something for me? You know what God did? He showed us kindness for the sake of Jesus Christ. 
It's not because of what we do for him or what we can do for him or what we might do for him. God is not all that concerned about whether or not you and I are going to fix all the problems of the world. Have you read the end of the book? God will come in and God will forcibly set things straight. God will settle the score. God will get the victory with or without me. That's why I want to be a part of it. Amen. I've had the attitude from the beginning, and I continue to have it this morning. Actually, I have it about 150% stronger than I ever did before. That if God's in this work, he'll get it done. I don't sit and worry, man. I used to make myself, I'm starting to get the wrinkles here. Somebody said to me the other day, he walked up to me at, it, it was Dave D. You, know, you all know how mean he is anyhow, so I'll tell you. He looked at me at Thursday night, and he said, just trying to see how tired you are. He's looking to see if my eyes are bloodshot. I said, no, I'm good. He said, yeah, you actually, you look pretty good other than those wrinkles, man. You've been aging a lot lately. <laughs> so, yeah, well, brother, it's because God sent you to my church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Everybody knows how much I love him. But, man, I'll tell you, just worrying about people and stressing about stuff, it'll wear you out. You know what? I, I don't know how it happened or why it happened, but it clicked in me within the last year. It's like I, I'm not even... Because if God's in it, it'll get done. Amen. Amen? I believe that with all my heart. I believe God showed me kindness because he loves Jesus Christ. And why? Well, what did Jonathan do for David? He was just good to him. He was faithful to him. He was a friend to him. Hey, you think of somebody who was good to Jesus Christ because it wasn't you and I. We crucified him. Can you think of somebody who was faithful to him because it hasn't been me? I sure failed. I fell down more times than I want to admit. I've failed him more than I want to tell you. I've disappointed him. I've broke his heart. I've been sinful. I've been unthankful. I've been ungodly towards him. Hey, it's not me who could boast in my faithfulness to the Lord. It's not me who can boast in my humility. It's not me who can boast in my spirituality. When I look at myself compared to Jesus, I'm nothing and I deserve the judgment and destruction of God, not the blessing. And yet he showed a kindness of a king to a dead dog like me. Why? On behalf of Jesus Christ. That's why the most important question anybody could ever answer in their entire life is, what have you done with Jesus? That's why salvation is not by grace through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why Jesus said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation comes through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the fact that he pleased the Father, for the fact that he went about doing good, for the fact that he fulfilled all the Father's will. He said everything God would have him to say. He didn't say things God wouldn't have him to say. He never succumbed to the temptation. He always walked with the Father and fellowshiped with the Father. He pleased God 100% of the time, and that's what it takes to get to heaven. I can't do it but Jesus did and because I've trusted Jesus Christ as my savior and I put my faith in him now God the father sits in heaven and he says is there any of the house of Saul do you have a lame one down there a useless one down there a piece of garbage down there that I can show kindness to because of Jesus sake I'm sure glad I got Jesus because without Jesus Christ I don't get the kindness of the father But let's not overlook the fact that David showed kindness to Mephibosheth because of David. You ever stop and think about that? He showed kindness to his enemy because that was in his character. Remember when Shimei went along after his rotten son Absalom sat in the gate and and told the fellas, you know, oh, the king, you know, he's too busy and he can't really get to you. Oh, I would that one were here to hear your matters because you're all so important. And he, he, he wooed all the men of the, uh, of the city and he got all the men behind him and then he bumped his dad out of the throne. And as his dad is running, because he's like, you know what, rather than say and destroy the thing, I'll just take off. If God wants me here, God will put me back. And so he goes and he takes off, and as he's leaving, Shimei is coming along there, he's throwing rocks at him, and he's cussing at him. Now, I don't know about you, but in a moment when I'm wounded, because the advisors to Absalom said, your father is as a bear who's been robbed of her whelps. And he said, he's a warrior, and he's got a bunch of warriors with him. He said, listen, don't push your luck. You better settle this thing. You better finish him off fast, because he is dangerous. Don't underestimate the old man. So I don't know about you, but a guy like that, 
in, in my own character, I'm wounded and I've been hurt and you walk up and start throwing rocks and cussing at me, 110% of my frustration and my anger is going to come pouring out, right? Because who are you? And I don't deserve that and I've never done anything but good to you and you're going to do that? I will take off your head. Which that's what one of his men said. Let me go over there and, and, and take off his head. And he said, no, let him go. <laughs> what a strange character. No, let, let him go. Maybe it's God's will for him to cuss me. What I'm trying to tell you is this man had some kind of character that's just outstanding. He has some kind of control over himself that I want. Amen. Reminds me of my Savior who willingly hung on that cross and allowed them to crucify him and to mock him and to make fun of him. And he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, but he died alone for you and me. He didn't do it. He hung there on that cross, taking my sin, taking my blame. Hey, the sun went black because he is the light of the sun. He's the one that created it. It shut off because it couldn't shine anymore because the creator, the perfect, sinless creator was made to be sin for me. He knew no sin, but he made to be sin for me that I could get the righteousness of God in him. I can't get it, but I accept it. I can't comprehend it but I know it to be true. It's more than what I can even fathom. It's, it's more than I would ever dream up in a million years of sitting around and studying how to write a great story that would really move millions over centuries and that would be the greatest selling book on the planet. It's more than I could ever come up with, but he did it. You know why David showed kindness to Mephibosheth? Because it was in his character. Not just for Jonathan, but... Because that's how he was. You know why God showed you and I kindness? Yes, for Jesus Christ, but don't forget it was God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Think he loved his son? I'm pretty sure he did. And he gave him for a dead dog? I can't understand how much he loves me. I know he does, but I can't understand it. It blows my mind. The last thing, and we'll get out of here this morning. His love went way farther. His kindness went way farther than Mephibosheth could have ever expected. See, he's sought by a servant of Saul. Look at verse 2. He says, Art thou Ziba at the end of the book? And he said, Thy servant is he. The king said, Is there not any yet of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God on him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan had yet a son which is lame in his feet. Didn't, didn't phase the king. Oh, can you find a better one? Can you find one that can serve me? Can you find one that can do something for me? Can you find somebody that can... No, not the king. The king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Mesher, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. The king sent and fetched him out of the house of Mesher, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. You know what I found interesting about that is how far the king went. Ziba was a servant of Saul. Well, I have a hard time befriending somebody who's a buddy of one of my enemies. I got that old school loyalty my dad drilled into my head. I mean, drilled into my head. I got a whooping one day, one day in elementary school when I came home, and I told my dad one of the other boys at school said X, Y, and Z about mom, and he said, did you punch him in the mouth? <laughs> Man, bless God. Praise God for the 80s. Amen? <laughs> and that ain't even the good old days. I said, no. He said, why not? You a chicken? I said, he's twice my size. He said, I could care less. Get in the kitchen. I'll be in there in a minute. <laughs> he said, don't you come home tomorrow unless you punched him in the mouth. I said, Dad, he's so much taller. He was a lot older than me. He was twice my size. Dad said, well, let me show you something. Here's the solar plexus. And we went through a little offensive. A self-defense is what you're supposed to be teaching. But we went through a little offensive lesson on how to hit the solar plexus to bring him down a little closer so she can hit the mouth. Amen. It's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> it's, well, that's wrong. Well, don't worry about it. That was my dad. It was the 80s, and praise the Lord for a dad. Amen? He was a good dad. Taught me not to let somebody say something about my mom. I could stop and preach on that right now, but I won't. I got enemies. You're going to be a buddy of my enemy? 
You ain't my friend. Right? I don't get that stuff. I don't get how somebody can be, be your friend and be somebody else's friend and he was a servant of your enemy. And uh-uh. I believe in being loyal. Amen. You ought to have that in our marriages and all that stuff, you know? You're disloyal if you go talking about your spouse to somebody else. I'm not talking about counseling because you're on the rocks and you need some help. You ought to be real careful about who you talk to and how. Amen. I believe in loyalty. I know David did. I know David did. He was a loyal friend. But he had such character that he didn't mind humbling himself to call his enemy's servant and say, Hey, come here. I need your help with something. The strange thing about God is that he will use people who at one time served the devil. Ain't that interesting? I'm glad God's willing to stoop himself to use somebody who doesn't deserve to be used, don't deserve to have their name in the book, don't deserve to be recognized, don't deserve anything, but that king is so kind, he'll use somebody who was once a servant of his enemy. And he used him because he loved and cared about Mephibosheth. Haven't you noticed God used some people in your life you wouldn't expect God to use? Has God ever used somebody in your life who's actually a bad testimony of what a Christian should be? Sure he has. But that's because God cares about you. He had a strange way of going about it. He takes, goes and he takes him and he brings him into his house. In verse 5, Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mesha, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Mephibosheth in verse 6 shows up in the house and he's coming to David. He fell on his face and did reverence. David said, Mephibosheth, he answered, Behold my, thy servant. David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread continually at my table continually. Not only does he say, listen, come here, I want to take care of you, Mephibosheth, but he goes so far then as to say, and I am going to give you your father's inheritance. He didn't deserve it. David went through all that he had gone through and all that he had suffered in order to get the kingdom and the least that he could get is all the land that came with it. The least that was owed him. And even Jonathan would say, no, give it to David. I mean, knowing Jonathan's character and the relationship they had, Jonathan would say, no, David, take my stuff. David knew Jonathan that well. And he had a right to take it all. But he's so kind. He said, I am going to give you what rightfully is mine. Hasn't God done that for you? Hasn't he given you and I more than we deserve? Hasn't he been better to us than we deserve? He sure has. He brings him into the king's house. I mean, as if that's not enough to be here this morning is the type. To be brought into the house of God. To be, listen, the house of God is not the building. It's the place where God's people meet. If God's people meet here, it doesn't matter whether it's a shed or a pavilion in the park or it's out in a field under the stars. It makes no difference whatsoever. The house of God is where God's people meet and where the word of God is being preached faithfully. That's the house of God. I am privileged. I am honored to be here this morning. Hey, it's not because of me that this thing even happened or that we're here. It's because God has been so kind to allow us to be here. Friends, we get the wrong attitude when it comes to church. Well, that's my job. Nobody spoke to me about that. Okay, well, if you were privileged to allow, be allowed to do something for a little while, then praise the Lord for it. But that's the wrong attitude. The right attitude is I can't believe God would allow a lame sinner like me to be brought into his house and to be fed continually at his table. That's what we're here for. We can't forget that. Churches too often become social clubs. We've got to fight against that we got to fight against, you know, having your feud two little friends and, and this is our little crew and this is our little buddies and this is our... Listen, when a visitor walks in those doors, maybe it's a Mephibosheth that God gets sent to Ziba and said, get him into the house. They ought to walk in and there ought to be room at the table because you scoot over. Amen. Because 
because God made room for you when you came. You sat in somebody's seat and they didn't never tell you. They just found another one. Well, not ever start that foolishness. I will fight it with every inch of my being. Well, you know them. Well, they're weird. Well, you know, did you see? Well, they're pretty low class. Okay, well, then move over so they can have the front seat, please. Amen. Amen. I'm not getting very amens on that. Thank you. It's not very many amens, but you knew I was getting at. Amen. We don't know what you're talking about, but are you done yet? Not only is he brought into the king's house, but I like this. He's fed continually at the king's table. Ain't that something else? Folks, it blows my mind that God feeds me from this book. It blows my mind. And when it dries up, I know whose fault it is. It's me. Because I sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I get to feeling like, God's been wheeling me around so much and carrying me here and there and blessing and feeding me and teaching me that after a little while, I forget how weak these are. And I'll be sitting in my chair and I'll be like, yeah, I'm good. I can do it. I'm, and I fall right flat on my face again. I forget that I'm lame. And what happens is when I forget that I'm lame and I think I know the Bible and I think I'm well-versed and I think I got a lot of scripture memory and I think I know what rightly inviting is, and I think all my schooling and all my time spent and all my messages I've listened to and all my mentors and all, and I'm really got this big head, the Bible dries up. My personal devotions are just lousy. And all of a sudden, I realize I'm lame. And I look over and I say, King, would you set the table, please? And this week, in my life, the King set the table. He gave me answers and he spoke to me and he showed me some stuff. And I learned some things I didn't know before. And I got some things brightened up in my head and irons wrinkled out. Because the king allows a dead dog to sit at his table and he feeds me continually. He has been so kind to me. And not only that, but there's a day coming when I'm going to drop dead, praise the Lord. Amen. Maybe I'll get hit by a truck or something like that. It'd be great. Maybe a Muslim will come into church and shoot me in the head for saying Muhammad's a false prophet, something cool like that. Yeah, I'm still a little boy inside, amen. And when I die, I get to go sit at the table. And that Jesus that we looked at on Thursday night and in the book of John who girds himself and comes by and washes the feet. He put it together institute, he washes the feet. Those dirty feet that have been walking in a sinful world, I'm clean. I'm completely clean. But when I confess my sin, when I mess up, not for my salvation, to stay clean, he washes them up. And I'm sitting there at the king's table, and I'm pulled up there, and I'm eating. And one day I die, and I go, and I sit at that table, and I eat again with my Savior. And I don't deserve it. Why, verse 8, what is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? See, this passage will be exactly an equivalent of a blessing to you as it is, as you realize, what I'm trying to say is, as you realize how much of a dog you are. See, the more self-righteous you are, the more spiritual you think you are, the less of a blessing this message is. But the more you realize you're a dead dog with nothing to offer, and he's given you everything, the more of a blessing this is. I know I'm a dead dog, and I got nothing to offer a king. (laughs) But the funniest thing is, is when I pull up to that table, you can't see my feet. You don't know what a dead dog I am, and I can't see yours. And he feeds us like a son, because he's kind. Stand, if you would, please, with your head.